I, I first want to thank everyone for coming today um, to the disparity seminar organized by the McLean Center and the Urban Health Initiative, uh, along with the Global Health Initiative and the RWJ program on finding answers. We, we have a group of distinguished visitors and guests from the University of Abaddon in Nigeria, and we're so glad to welcome you. Well, welcome to Chicago. Um, our speaker today uh, will be Dr. Stacy Lindau, um, a uh, who's in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Department of Medicine, uh, McLean Center, and in the Urban Health Initiative. Um, Dr. Lindau is the principal investigator of the Southside Health and Vitality Studies and directs the population-based biosocial and health technology research using a community-engaged, minimally invasive approach. Dr. Lindau also directs the Chicago Corps on Biomarkers um, uh, in population-based health and aging research. Um, she does many other things, uh, leading the population-based integrated biology research core at the University of Chicago's Institute for Translational Medicine. Uh, as a practicing gynecologist, uh, Stacy translates her population-based research into clinical care uh, via an interdisciplinary program that provides medical, psycho psychosocial, and physical therapy for women uh, seeking to prevent sexual problems and to recover sexual function after cancer treatment um, and induced menopause. Uh, it's, it's really a tremendous pleasure. I know how busy, you can hear how busy Stacy is in her many activities. Uh, Stacy will speak today on asset-based approaches to urban health. Please join me in welcoming Stacy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me to speak. It's an honor and really I'm speaking on behalf of a whole lot of people, many of whom are staring at my back, unfortunately, and many of whom are in this room who um, work together on the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. I want to compliment the McLean Center and your work. The, there's an excellent website that has all of the talks in this lecture series beautifully produced. Kudos to the cameraman. Um, <laughs> I'm sure nobody's acknowledged you before, right? Um, which I really appreciate because for personal reasons um, I've not been able to participate as much as I would have liked in this conference series this year and it's been very helpful for me to be able to follow those talks online and I encourage those of you who haven't seen them to see them. I want to mention for example um, Rob Sampson's work, Kathleen Cagney's work, um, Marge Cohen, these are all people whose work um, have been an inspiration to me in my own work. These are all people who've spoken in this conference over the last year and it's just an incredible series and I want to thank you for doing it. Thank Eric Whitaker, I know the Urban Health Initiative and uh, Fumi Olapati and the Global Health Initiative and Marshall Chin's um, group also have supported this excellent series. Um, I want to start by telling a story and uh, it's it's a kind of a microcosm of what I hope the Southside Health and Vitality Studies will be. And the story starts with a uh, conversation actually between myself and Dorian Miller, one of my partners in crime. Dorian had talked with Reverend Hutt. This is Reverend Hutt, I don't think she's here today. This is Reverend Hutt, who's one of the Reverend uh, chaplains at the Comer Children's Hospital. I'm a gynecologist, so I don't spend a lot of time there, but Dorian told me one day, shortly after she'd come to back to the University of Chicago, having been here as a student, a medical student, she told me that Reverend Hutt had observed hungry parents at the bedsides of their children in Comer Hospital, and that the Reverend had observed a parent being hungry enough to ask the resident whether the resident could get her a sandwich or some food. And essentially, and of course, it's a little bit of a game of telephone, but the response was, no, I don't have a way of doing that. And it raised the question about hunger in our children's hospital, hunger among parents trying to care for their sick children and make important decisions about their sick children um, while being hungry. And it just so happened that a, a couple days later I'd been invited by Dr. Monica Vela to give a talk to the incoming medical students during their summer um, immersion course about the physician's responsibility to the poor and underserved. 
So at the end of my talk, because this conversation with Dorian had been really bothering me, I said to the students, you know, if, there's, if you want to take your energy and do something good, why don't you help us solve this problem? Reverend Hudd over at the Children's Hospital knows that there are parents who are hungry at their bedside, and she needs a way to help, help provide them food with dignity. So a couple students, and, and here they are here, um, including from left to right, if you can see them, Dan Thorngren, Robert Stern, Kevin Heaton, Avram Kaplan. These were first-year medical students who sat in the lecture hall, heard the story, and decided they were going to do something about it. Rob Stern called me up or emailed me and said, I want to do something to help solve this problem. What can I do? And we connected him up with Reverend Hutt. And over time, using some of the, the institutional resources from the Urban Health Initiative that had allowed me to hire some research staff, like Jennifer McLarsky, who was just a, at that time hadn't even completed her PhD, um, got together and very quickly solved this problem. They didn't solve it alone. Part of the question was, where do we get food? And how can a rich institution like ours not be able to provide a meal for a hungry parent? There just wasn't a way to do it. And I said, you know, let's, let's um, call the Greater Chicago Food Depository. One of the trustees from the medical center was serving on the advisory board to the Urban Health Initiative. And she was also on the board at the Greater Chicago Food Depository and had connected us up to a really great research team at that organization. So we called them up and said, hey, we have this problem. Um, we feel embarrassed to call and ask you to provide food to us given our riches, but maybe it's an opportunity for you to expand your services. And they were thrilled with the idea. And through the sheer will of the medical students working with Reverend Hutt, working with the researchers here, working with a strong community-based organization, we've set up a food pantry. I should really say they've set up a food pantry, a closet um, in the chaplain's space that provides food to hungry parents in the, in the um, children's hospital. And so since February 2010, when this pantry came into being, they've distributed 3,000 pounds of food purchased for $1,058, or $1.75 per bag, distributed to, as I understand, more than 300, more than 450 families, some of whom were grateful enough that they continue to work with the program to help us distribute or food or load up the pantry. And um, nurses and the chaplains and others, residents have have noted how the food, the gift of food and the appreciation of the stress for parents has really helped engage parents more in their child's care and has pr improved interactions between the nursing staff and the parents. So why do I tell you this story? Is this, this, isn't, um, this isn't a product necessarily of research. This is the product of a need and putting our heads together to solve a really terrible problem but with a pretty simple solution. And then we hang research around it to figure out how much does it cost, how much food do we give out, how do we um, keep this sustainable, and how do we replicate it elsewhere. So this to me, the story of the, the Comer Food Pantry, is really um, the ideal for what I hope the Southside Health and Vitality Studies will be. I, I came to the Southside Health and Vitality Studies because Eric Whitaker called me up and said, I have a dream. And so when someone like Eric Whitaker says, I have a dream, someone like me responds. Um, I'm primarily, I've been primarily a sexuality researcher, but working in, in the population health arena. And this was an opportunity to take what I learned about population health and how to study it and translate it to something I care a lot about, which is the communities that we serve by virtue of working here at the University of Chicago. So the objectives of my talk today are first to help um, you understand the aims and scope of the Southside Health and Vitality Studies, to become familiar with the asset-based, community-engaged research approach, and hopefully, most importantly, I'd like to spark new ideas in this group about how your work and skills can benefit and be stimulated by the local community. And just a note on that, I've had a few notable experiences here with faculty outside the medical school who have said, you know, I'm interested in working with you because you were giving me an opportunity to see that my work has meaning in the human context. One was a chemist, uh, Rustamis Magalov. He's a basic science chemist who was designing new ways to collect blood um, in, in tiny little small tubes and analyze it. He was motivated to work with us because he thought maybe these tubes he was designing could be a benefit to the health of the local population. Another person is someone named Charlie Catlett. 
He's a computationist. He's um, a, a senior person at Argonne National Laboratories who is motivated to work with us because, again, we are providing an outlet for him to feel that his work has salience in the real world. That's one of the opportunities of working at an institution like the University of Chicago that's situated on the south side of Chicago. I just start by, um, by way of transparency to disclose the funding sources. We are fortunate to have, um, first and foremost, really seed funding from the University of Chicago through the Urban Health Initiative. Without that, it would have been very, a very, very big risk for me to kind of stop or, or add on to what I was doing to take on this work, and that's true for many of the other people who've been involved, have been directly supported by the Urban Health Initiative. Many others have not been directly supported, and we keep writing grants to bring support on more and more for the people who are involved. Um, we've had individual philanthropy. We've had major foundation funding. We have corporate funding from PepsiCo, an interesting story that I'm happy to answer questions about if people want to know more. Um, and we have funding from the National Institutes of Health. This is two years worth of, uh, we started two years ago. And to me, the, the speed of trajectory of the funding for this project reflects the tremendous diversity of people involved and this asset-based community-engaged approach, which I think is quite novel and has really gotten the attention of funders, including ranging from PepsiCo to Chicago Community Trust to the National Institutes of Health. This will be hard for you to see if you're in the back, but it, this is our organizational chart, and I think what I just want you to walk away knowing is that the Southside Health and Vitality Studies sits within Dorian Miller's Center for Community Health and Vitality, and the Center for Community Health and Vitality um, is sitting within the Urban Health Initiative led by Dr. Eric Whitaker, both of whom are in the room today and have been tremendous champions, not only champions of the Southside Health and Vitality Studies, but really my entree into the community. My touch with community has been as a practicing physician here. I pra started my practice at the Friend Family Health Center. I worked in student care. I, work at the, I have a practice at the DCAM. But really, the kinds of relationships that I need in order to do research in the community have been forged through the tremendous amount of street credibility um, and um, courage and friendships that Eric and Dorian bring to this work. It would be simply, we would, there's no way we would be where we were if, if that weren't the case. And we also have a broad variety of community partners working with us. This just highlights the logos of the community partners working on something called asset mapping. I'll tell you about that. Alianza in the east side neighborhood, the Greater Auburn Gresham uh, Development Corporation, Kenzie and Kenzie Communications, New Ways Learning, a health literacy organization, uh, Quad Communities Development Corporation, and Washington Park Consortium. These people, these organizations have been at the table with us now for a good two years, um, heavily kept together on the project by Daniel Johnson in pediatrics, Colleen Grogan from SSA, who've helped to lead this um, asset mapping project. And again, you won't be able to see a lot here, but what I, this is just one example of one, one of our several working groups for the studies. Southside Health and Vitality Studies is organized by working groups working on various aspects. This is the Community Engagement and Ethics and Human Subjects Working Group members. So there are about 25 individuals here, some from university, many from community, and a really diverse range of community members. Merck and Company, a pharmaceutical company, big na international um, company, to um, you know, Youth and Family Services or Chicago State University, to individuals um, who are interested in what we're doing. The studies are open to anyone who wants to be involved. We welcome you, and it can be coming once in a while to our monthly meetings or it can be real active involvement. The mission of the studies is, is um, very closely aligned with the mission of the Urban Health Initiative. That is to create and share knowledge with our community to produce and sustain excellent health and vitality on Chicago's south side and beyond. What do we mean by health? We adopt a World Health Organization definition of health, which is not just the absence of disease or infirmity, but um, health writ more broadly. And vitality refers to um, the health of the, at the community level, the health of our um, community organizations and the ability of our communities to continue to develop in a positive way. The vision is that the south side of Chicago is a model of exemplary urban health by 2025. That's not a lot of time. There's a lot of work to be done. But that's the vision that keeps us moving. There's certainly a lot of opportunity for improvement. So what are the research aims? This, the reason we're called the studies plural is that we are many interrelated efforts. And I'm going to try to walk you through those. The Comer Food Pantry I think of as one of the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. 
but, um, but uh, that's why we're plural. It's a little bit awkward. And therefore, each one of the individual studies has its own specific aims. These are the broad aims of the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. So in a low-income urban area with a fragmented, heterogeneous healthcare infrastructure, one, what is the duration and quality of assets, I'm sorry, what is the distribution and quality of assets in the region? And are these being optimized to promote health and manage disease? It's a very simple question. Before we start building new systems and new programs, what do we have to work with? What's out there? What are all the assets um, available to us? Secondly, what is the status of population health and how does it change in relation to de designed and natural experiments? What's a designed experiment? Providing food at the Comer Food Pantry. There's a designed experiment. What's the impact of that experiment on health of people? And then thirdly, because technology is an area of high interest to the community, we are starting to explore how technology services, cell phones, internet, other sorts of services can be optimized for health, health care, and social connectedness. These aims have evolved over time. We didn't just start with these aims. They've come out of close um, conversation and collaboration with many, many community members. And frankly, they've also been shaped in part by what we think is fundable. And I th we have to be honest about that. <clears throat> Without funding, we won't be able to do the work at all. Each of the aims indicates um, which organization is funding the work. And there um, are some organizations we're in process with in terms of pursuing funding. This is one example of, um, of our, the breadth of our collaboration. These are university faculty and senior research staff who are actively involved in aspects of the studies. There are many, many others. But the dean, for example, is quite interested to see um, how many different departments and divisions across the institution are working on the project. And we'd love to see your name up there, too. I want to just take a moment to put the, the work we're doing in context of, of what's going on with health reform. So one question we have as we work with the Urban Health Initiative is, what's, what's our health system on the south side of Chicago? And while that hasn't been my primary focus with the, with the Urban Health Initiative, Kim Hobson has been working with, on the work started by Laura Dirks um, and working with many, many um, healthcare organizations on the south side of Chicago in, in the auspices of something called the Southside Healthcare Collaborative. The Southside Healthcare Collaborative, as I understand it, includes now more than 30 federally qualified health centers. 34 federally qualified health centers located on the south side of Chicago and all of the major hospitals, including the University of Chicago Medical Center. So probably close to 40 partners now inside that organization, which was seated here at the University of Chicago, but which has now evolved into what will become its own 501c3 organization led by one of the um, FQHC leaders. That Southside Healthcare Collaborative, as far as I know, is really the first serious attempt to get a handle on what is the healthcare system on the south side of Chicago. Frankly, we don't, we've never had a system. We had a whole bunch of players not talking to each other, and we had a population whose health wasn't, um, I don't think, up to par for how many players we had. The Southside Healthcare Collaborative, as far as we can tell, is really unique. As we go around the country talking to other um, academics and other policy leaders about um, healthcare reform, it seems to us that having a collaborative that's talking about building a health system in an urban area like ours that involves so many different players, I think the FQHCs are distributed across eight different independent corporations, and of course the hospitals are also owned independently, is a really unique entity. And that's what I mean by a heterogeneous um, environment. If we can figure out how to build an integrated, smooth, efficient system of healthcare on the south side of Chicago, given the heterogeneous environment of health players, We've solved a problem that will be salient for lots of other urban environments where we don't have a Kaiser Permanente who's taking, or a Mayo Clinic that's taking care of 90% of the health of the population. So the fact that we are diverse and that we are complex is an opportunity for us rather than a problem. So we're thinking about whether there's a health system and how do we create a health system, and others are thinking about this too. The Institute of Medicine and the World Health Organization are talking about the health system as an intersectoral health system. It's a word that when we put it on the screen at our last um, meeting with our Board of Trustees, um, they all said we have no idea what that even means. The point is that um, leading um, world organizations are saying that the health system goes beyond those providing medical care. It requires, and here specifically, it comprises the government public health agencies and various partners, 
including communities, the clinical care delivery system like the University of Chicago Medical Center, employers and business, the mass media, and academe. Who's not part of the health system is what I want to know. And this definition is one that was published in a 2010 Institute of Medicine report funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and one that's being echoed very in using the exact same terminology by the World Health Organization. Okay, so let's adopt that definition of the health system. Has anyone ever described anywhere the, all the components of the intersectoral health system and how they're working together? Has it ever been empirically um, evaluated or studied? The answer is no. But where are we starting to do this? Here on the south side of Chicago, where we're mapping every single built asset in the primary service area of the University of Chicago, which includes 34 community areas in the entire 77 community area city of Chicago, and trying to understand if everybody's in the health system, well then what's everybody's role in the health system? That's one part of what we're doing. Now in talking about the health systems, we have a definition of inter intersectoral, and we have a definition of the health system also coming from the Institute of Medicine. In describing and using the term the health system, the committee seeks to reinstate the proper and evidence-based understanding of health is not merely the result of medical or clinical care, but the result of the sum of what we do as a society to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. And this is why we are called the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. We need vital communities, we need a vital region, urban area, so that people can be healthy. So these are, we're working with these concepts and in a proposal we just wrote to NIH, aim one was to empirically describe for the first time the intersectoral health system. Like if that's our definition, let's take it seriously and see what it really means. So this is a figure from the, the proposal we just submitted and uh, because we're so nascent, I, I can really only talk about the proposals we submitted, less so the papers we've published or the problems we fully <laughs> solved. That's why I started with the food pantry because we actually did something there. Um, but but to, to give you those, those aims, those research aims in another format, I want you to start here. First of all, what are the assets in the community? What, are, what is the availability of assets? Are people aware of these assets? Are people using the assets? Why or why not? And we're starting to get a little bit of handle on that already. Second of all, how are the assets in our community related to people's perceived and evaluated health? What we mean by evaluated health, this is where my my experience um, collecting biological measures using minimally invasive methods and population research is helpful. We ask people what they think their health is, but we can also measure from a few drops of blood from the tip of the finger somebody's hemoglobin A1C level to determine whether or not they have diabetes or prediabetes, somebody's blood count to see if they're anemic, and a whole variety of other factors that help us give an objective, evaluated measure of health. And over time, I imagine, I'm hoping that our colleagues at the University of Chicago are going to help us develop more measures so we can get a more robust assessment of population health without having to bring people into the clinical setting for really expensive evaluation. Thirdly, you know, I told you people, um, we have learned from community members that there's a real high interest in digital communication technology high uptake, a sense that we're on the wrong side of the digital divide and the data that are available would corroborate that, um, and a feeling that if only we had better access to internet, um, higher speed internet, and um, smartphones, that we could really make up a lot of ground in some of the disparities um, in health on the south side. So to what degree is digital communication technology related to people's awareness and use of the assets in our community? Which places in the community are offering people free Wi-Fi or terminals where they can get their work done if they don't have access to these things at home? And then finally our question is, does digital communication technology help drive health through more use of community assets or does digital communication technology potentially substitute for needing local assets, places you can go, in order for people to be healthy? Can people diagnose themselves by getting on the internet or figure out how to treat some first aid problems um, with internet access and therefore don't need to go to an emergency department or don't need to go to a Walgreens clinic? Maybe in some cases they do. We want to understand where we can substitute and be more efficient and where digital communication technology drives health. So I've given you, I hope, some insight to what we mean by asset-based community engaged research. But here's just a little bit more information um, to share with you a paper that we recently published in the journal Preventive Medicine. <clears throat> Michelle Obama, as many of you know, um, preceded Eric Whitaker here at the Medical Center and as I understand it was active in recruiting him as she went on to um, take her position as First Lady. 
she was involved with something called the Asset-Based Community Development Institute at Northwestern. She's a faculty member there. And that work, the work of that institute, has influenced our approach to community-engaged research. I really appreciate this quote from her. We can't do well serving these communities if we, the givers, are the only ones that are half full and if everybody we're serving is half empty. There are assets and gifts out there in the communities and our job as good servants and good leaders is not just being humble, but it's having the ability to recognize those gifts and others and help them put those gifts into action. Communities are filled with assets that we need to better recognize and mobilize if we're really going to make a difference. Now, I'd like to say that I heard her say this or I saw this quote before we went um, full steam down the path of an asset-based approach, but in fact, it was only about maybe six months ago that I came across this quote from her. It's not a surprise because Leif Elsmo, who's in the back of the room, worked with Michelle Obama and it was Leif who really introduced me and to the others um, with the Southside Health and Vitality Studies uh, to the idea of asset-based community development. So building on the work of John Kretzman and John McKnight at the, at the Northwestern Institute, I've actually never met them personally and I'd like to and I think we should maybe invite them to come here sometime. Um, we've developed this graphic schematic of an asset-based approach for our research. And what this schematic says is that our work begins and never ends with respect to community engagement and relationship building. That turns the wheel. We start with identifying community priorities. We define the aims for the Southside Health and Vitality Studies both by what talents and skills we had among the university researchers who came to the table and by the areas of highest interest to community members. Did we just survey people once? No. Every time we interact in our research meetings with community members, we ask, are we on to the right thing? Are we asking the right questions? Are the data we're showing you salient to the work you're doing? And if not, what do we need to do differently? We just came from a meeting like that today. Once we've identified priorities, we start to identify the assets in the community. We have, um, under the leadership, as I mentioned before, of Daniel Johnson and Colleen Grogan and many others working on the Asset Census Project, have been literally deploying teams of people walking up and down every single street in now 11 communities uh, of 34 on the south side of Chicago to identify every single asset. We're not mapping private homes, but every business establishment, any public place or um, even private place where people could potentially go to get services. Once we know where all the assets are, we can then begin to leverage those assets towards our goal of exemplary health in, in this urban area by 2025. We're building assets too. I think the Southside Healthcare Collaborative is an example of an asset that we're building at the same time as we're measuring and, and, and identifying assets. We leverage these assets in part to help us conduct research, in part to inform our day-to-day -day activities, and importantly, to generate new knowledge. When we generate new knowledge, that has to be fed back to the community for priority setting. So hopefully over time our priorities change because we're checking some things off the list. Okay, we solved that problem, now the next one can come to the top. I'm just going to share some pictures with you. These are of um, uh, in our large interactions with community. This was our first retreat in December 2008 the Little Black Pearl. I think we had about 50 or 60 people there, more university than community people. Our second retreat was uh, in October 2009 at the DuSable Museum. Um, at this retreat, we had closer to 100 people and closer to a 50-50 distribution. It was between that first retreat and the second retreat, December 2009, where we had six communities mapped with asset data. We brought the data back to the retreat. We sh people broke out into small groups and had computer screens to work with. People told us what they liked, what else they needed, and people said we need to know what services are being offered in all these places. Not just good enough to know there's a church, I need to know is there daycare there? Can I get diabetes screening there? You know, what, what kinds of services are available? So between October 2009 and our next retreat, we wrote several grants that allowed us to get that service mapping off the ground. This is critical. This is what um, community, en the community engaged part of asset-based community engaged research is. It's bringing the ideas to, um, to the table, and the table includes community and university people working together, hearing people's ideas, and then executing on them. And that's critical for building trust. And then this is our recent retreat, December 2010, at the South Shore Cultural Center. Rebecca Holbrook, who's up here, has been actively involved for a long time and is involved with our Ethics and Human Subjects Working Group. I 
I think that might be Shane with New Ways, um, New Pathways Learning, who looks like he has a headache. <laughs> um, he's also been with us. He's a veteran with us since the beginning. We had um, Leif. How many people? 200, and about 60 percent were um, community members uh, representing as far as we know, at least 30 or 40 different community organizations. It was a tremendous um, uh, growth in our participation. We had the Illinois um, uh, Commissioner for the Department of Health and, uh, with us, as well as Chicago's Commissioner for the Department of Health there. We had these amazing graphic artists who kind of summarized everything that happened during the course of the day graphically on these giant whiteboards um, that evolved. They just appear during the day. And bringing the humanities to the work that we're doing, I think, is a really interesting opportunity. How, because um, the work we're doing is very humanistic, and sometimes it's much better summed up in something like this than in a paper in preventive medicine. So what assets do we have to work with to achieve this vision of um, healthiest urban area by 2025? Well, this is one of the earliest um, uh, maps that we generated when we were thinking about how to build the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. We contracted with an organization called the Metro Chicago Information Center. We paid them money to take 2,000 census data and impute it so that it was relevant for 2008, 2009. And they helped us generate maps to summarize the sociodemographic and health conditions in the region of interest. So what you see here is um, a black boundary showing, in fact, one day I just gerrymandered the border, so Chicago Long is now part of the south side of Chicago. But at this point in time, they weren't. Um, I also included, the, I added the near south side to the south side of Chicago, too. So right here you see only 32 community areas. That was a decision. It was. That was a, <laughs> what the heck? I was like, you know what? These two communities need to be in the south side, and we just put them in there. So um, nobody objected. I, I, I was transparent. Nobody said they shouldn't be there. So in any case, this chart shows you the gradations in income. And this is um, communities, uh, the percent of households in each community with an annual income less than $25,000. That's not a lot of income. What does it cost an undergrad a year to go to the University of Chicago? Anyone know? 56000 OK. OK, it was in the newspaper. OK, we believe it if it was in the newspaper. If it sounds good to me. That's not a lot of money, less than $25,000 a year. The darkest blue shaded areas are mean that 48 to 65 percent of the households are living at less than $25,000 in 2008. This is Hyde Park. Here's the University of Chicago. We are surrounded uh, in a, by a horseshoe or, or some other metaphor of communities living in extreme poverty. Now, this is a call to action. It wasn't a terrible surprise, unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's not exactly an asset-based way of looking at things. So if we only think about the south side of Chicago by the prevalence of poverty, and if I put up the map of diabetes deaths or cardiovascular disease deaths or um, infant mortality, it would look really very much the same as this map. Okay? It's a, it's an, the, to the best of our ability to tell an accurate view of things, the data are quite limited. Do you know we haven't had any population health estimates of people living on the south side of Chicago since 2004? And those data were really based on pretty um, uh, coarse measures of health. So if a community organization is working on HIV AIDS or working on diabetes, how do they write a grant justifying their mission? when We don't even have current data about the prevalence of disease. Dr. Miller is going to be a talk, giving a talk in, or did you already, in Hyde Park. She gave a talk in Hyde Park on diabetes. And so I, we, were, we said, OK, well, can we get some maps together for Dorian about the prevalence of diabetes in Hyde Park so she has some salient data? No. We had diabetes deaths in Hyde Park with a lot of variance around the estimates from 2004 based on not great data. But we didn't have diabetes prevalence or diabetes risk. We don't have these data for the south side of Chicago, and we really desperately need them to do this work. This is, I'm sorry, this is a terrible chart that people like Marshall Chin and others in the room who've mentored me as a research will, you know, surely slap my hand um, after the talk for putting it up here. But it's really important, and so I just want to make a couple points about it. This summarizes sociodemographic and health characteristics using those old 2004 data. Um, in our study region, okay? First row, national data, Chicago, 
south side. The so south side of Chicago has current estimates somewhere around 870,000 people. Best data we have available looks like somewhere between a 4 and 7 percent population loss since the 2000 census. We'll know better in June or July when those data become available. So 870,000 people. These are the 11 communities where we've done asset mapping, mapping all the built assets in the community. Okay? Let's just look at a couple um, comparisons here. Average, um, uh, let's say, African American um, population, 12.3 percent national, 33.6 percent Chicago, 71.4 percent South Side, and many of our communities are almost 100 percent. Englewood, 98.8 percent, Washington Park, 98.7 percent, Auburn Gresham, 98.6 percent African American. The South Side of Chicago has one of the largest contiguous African American populations in the United States which again is an opportunity. It, you know, it puts a, a great deal of, um, I want to say, pressure on us to learn as much as we can about the health of Af African American population because we have such a large population here that both we are serving and can tell us something about health of African American urban populations in other cities around the country. Hispanic, percent Hispanic, most think of more the west side of Chicago as being uh, where the Hispanic population is concentrated. National 12.5%, Chicago 27.3%, South Side a little bit higher than National, but we have a few community areas with large Hispanic populations, Chicago Lawn, East Side, and South Chicago. East Side 77.6% Hispanic with a strong federally qualified health center, the leader of which is heading that South Side Healthcare Collaborative I mentioned before and is actively involved in this asset mapping project that we've been doing. I want you to take a quick look at um, percent uh, living at less than two times the federal poverty level, national 31.4, south side 49.5. Look at how many communities are living. Look at this. Washington Park, 74.2 percent living. This, this community is on our border. Seven, does, you know, people come here and work, or do we realize 74 percent, three quarters of the population are living at less than two times the federal poverty level? What does that mean for our responsibility um, when we come to work and do our research here at the medical center. And then a couple things on the death side. Now these are the health indicators from those 2004 Chicago Department of Public Health data. If you're interested, you can get them from the website yourself. Um, death rates. Chicago as a city overall has lower annual death rates per 10K population than nationally. Let's look at some of the death rates here. So let's say our benchmark is 73, 123 in Grand Crossing, 200 in Woodlawn where, by the way, 65 percent of the population is between the ages of 35 and 49. Okay. Cancer rates, they, they all follow the same pattern. There's nothing here that um, you know, really jumps out as, as not making sense. But it's also a call to action. So these are some of the people we call to action. And these are the people who are doing the asset mapping project. In the first year, July 2009, we had teams of university students working with teams of um, students hired from the community, managed by the University of Chicago Survey Lab, which been, has been a phenomenal partner in this work. Um, these were the first people to go out and start documenting every built asset in the community. They had PDA phones. They were pre, the phones were pre-programmed with purchase lists of asset data. We paid good money for those lists. Dunn and Bradstreet, they make a lot of money from selling these lists. 40% on average of the assets we found, these guys found, were not on the most recent purchase Dun and Bradstreet list. And several, I think it was also close to 40%, 30 to 40% of the things on their list we didn't find. So guess what? We now have the criterion standard asset data for this region. We have to figure out how to sell it <laughs> so we can keep this project going. But we should be competing with Dun and Bradstreet. Yes, something like that, Far, I'm going to help you negotiate that. So, and the students, I mean, we had beautiful essays from the students on our blog and who came to the meeting and said, I've been living in these communities all my life. I had no idea how much there was there. So it was, you know, really exciting. And within six weeks of them completing their data collection, all of these data were on a brand new website, or an expanded, actually, website that Urban Health Initiative already started called southsidehealth.org. Um, and available to the community. So by, by the time we got back together with the community, 10 months later, people had this website to look at and could make use of the data themselves. 
In 2010, um, we expanded the asset mapping to include several communities. Auburn Gresham actually came to our group and said, hey, we hear you're doing this and we want to be part of this asset mapping and we've got a bunch of high school students working for an After Schools Matters program who need a good summer activity. Could they do the work? We thought, ooh, high school students, we're worried about safety, can they really do a good job, et cetera. They were phenomenal. And I think to some degree, community members and business owners were a little bit even more sympathetic to the high school students and more welcoming of them. And again, we heard the same thing. I learned about things in my community I'd never seen before. And it was a, um, this was just part of the team that was doing some of the mapping um, last summer. So these are the blue line shows you the communities where we have um, now built asset census data, 11 of 34 communities, really in two summers of mapping. We've got to get to all 34 communities, and we're in the meantime trying to figure out how to keep these data updated. We have updated six of these communities, and we're going to show you some data from that. Here are the six community pilot from the first summer. Um, these, are the, these are some of the data that we collected. This is the number of built assets per 1,000 population. So for example, Hyde Park, 28 assets per 1,000 population. Kenwood, nine. Is that because Kenwood is an impoverished area? No, we were talking about this meeting before. So there are a lot of large single family homes in Kenwood. And we can see that only, you know, even in Kenwood, which most of us regard as a wealthy community, 40% living at less than two times the federal poverty level, um, but still um, among the lower rates of poverty uh, as compared to some of our other communities. And this is a map um, that is an example of what we can generate now for the communities that have been mapped. Here's a map of select diabetes-related assets in Grand Boulevard. You go on to southsidehealth.org, you can generate this map for yourself in two seconds. It's really easy and it's available to everybody. But here, for example, we mapped health clinics, grocery stores, and the rare fitness facility. You can't do this on Yelp or Google. You can only map a certain place. You can't map places by disease or by need. So we think we have something really special here. It takes a lot of human effort to get to it. We've got to figure out how to make it efficient, sustainable, and always up to date. Imagine, though, I just want to go back for one second. Imagine if we intersected the asset mapping data with the electronic medical records. And you hit diabetes as a diagnosis. And Epic, the wizard behind Epic, somehow queries this database and sees the patient's address and the patient's diagnosis and spits this out at the end of the visit. And the patient leaves not just with a diagnosis, but a place where they can improve their wellness despite their diagnosis or maybe even turn the course of their disease around. So we're working on that idea. A lot of people are involved in that. I don't think it's, it's certainly very doable. It's a matter of resources, but would be quite exciting. Here shows you the additional communities where we have started to do the service mapping really trying to get it under the skin of the organizations to understand what they're offering, and we're very much in process with that. Washington Park, um, which has fewer total number of assets, but should be commended because they're close to 36% um, of all of their assets having its service data in the system. <coughs> and here, this just shows that we have a Get on the Map campaign, working with Survey Lab and our community partners to get all the asset data, the service data for every place into the, the southsidehealth.org system. This is a picture of southsidehealth.org. Um, we also recently bought, I'm, I think this is really exciting, can you believe nobody owned dondeesta.org? Where is .org? I'm the proud owner of dondeesta. This is how I'm gonna get rich and it's all gonna go back into southsidehealth.org. Um, but we have now translated um, the website into Spanish, especially for um, you know, the population on East Side, which has been working very hard on this project, uh, has a large um, primary Spanish-speaking population. We also bought ChicagoHealth.org. Can you believe no one owned that one? So once, the, once we expand to the whole city, we're all set. <laughs> Quickly, um, this is a map of the, um, of the asset data showing gains and losses over one year. This, this generated a lot of discussion in our last large group meeting for the studies. We meet every month, second Wednesday of the month, 11 to 12.30, everybody's welcome. And we have been now having the great um, experience of being able to share back the data and get people's reaction to it. So now you've had a chance to look at this for a minute. These are one-year gains, losses of community assets 
across all sectors in the six communities that have been mapped twice. These data were not, nobody has these data. They've never been available. I guess you could buy the Dun and Bradstreet data and do it, but most organizations don't have access to that. So all sectors, if you just looked at all sectors, it would look like things stayed the same. Oh, we had 1,976 assets. Then we have 1,976 now. Oh, the economy's gone to hell, but not, it doesn't seem like anything's changed. We're all good and OK. When we put these data up, several community members said, you're finally, with a University of Chicago stamp, telling the world what we know. You're telling us what we know, but now we can take these data with the University of Chicago logo on it, and maybe the policymakers will pay a little bit more attention. Um, so just to give you some examples, um, Jennifer McElarsky by hand weighted the, the area, the square area of these bars to the, the number of services. So the fatter ones have more service, you know, financial insurance, real estate, and legal had 235, so it's really fat, versus industrial where we lost two or three industrial sites, um, but it's only an N of eight, so it's really skinny. So there's a lot of fluctuation over one year, and what does this mean for the health of our population? I'm interested in this. 50 public service organizations, police, fire, postal, government. A little more than 10%, so five gone in six communities. We need to understand, were the five police stations gone? Five fire stations gone? What is this? Those could have real implications for the health of our population. How do people find places and services for health? So this is, um, this is really the critical issue. Once we, we, we're classifying all these assets, we're finding all the assets, we're describing all the assets, um, and we know where they all are, maybe we know what their value is, we know which ones are good and bad. The next question is, how do people get to these assets? You know, is it true that the reason why people don't have, um, you know, get access to health care is because we don't have enough appointment slots for people to get preventive care? Or the reason why people don't get um, a shelter, a homeless shelter at night on a freezing cold night because we don't have enough slots or spaces or beds in our homeless shelters? That's the going theory. And in some places, that is true. There's over demand for high quality services. We have a sense, though, that there probably is some underutilization or there's some mismatch. We don't have people's demands best match with the services available. So we made this argument to the National Institutes of Health, and they awarded us a grant to try to figure this thing out. And this is called the Chicago Health and Aging Services Exchange. We asked for a million dollars. We got $100,000. But we got the stamp of approval of NIH. So we can design the thing in our minds, and then we have to get more resources to build it. There are a broad variety of um, organizations involved with this. Some of them are represented here um, across the university and across the community. We have Mitch Katz, who's the, um, the immediate past commissioner of public health for the city of San Francisco, just took over LA County, is part of our team. John Skinner, who's a, a phenomenal health economist from Dartmouth, is part of our team. And it's a really exciting project if you want to get involved. What we're trying to figure out is how do we make it so that a person, almost like buying an airline ticket, can get on the website, enter their special needs, their preferences, and get matched with options for the services they need. Not only that, but we're interested in tracking the activity in this marketplace. How many people demanded HIV AIDS services? How many people demanded food support services? What was the geographic distribution of that demand? How does it relate to the location of food distribution sites in our community? How does it change over time? Which places have the most demand with the longest waiting list of people who want to get in? Because if I'm a volunteer, I want to go work at that clinic. Or if I'm a philanthropist, I want to send my money there. Because the long waiting list are probably a decent indicator, assuming there's more than one option, of quality. We don't know that for sure, but these are the kinds of questions we want to be asking. And as quickly as possible, we want to have a web-based solution where people in need of services can get matched to services. And we can start to bring some transparency to the health and human services system so we can see how people are using or not using what's available. And then finally, I keep mentioning technology. So I mean, I'm a gynecologist. I am extremely humbled by all of the work we're doing. On a given day, I have to understand how aromatase inhibitors um, affect the anatomy of a woman's vulva and how people are using their cell phones to find food support you know, in the city of Chicago. It is overwhelming, but it's so exciting to have an opportunity to really make an impact. So we have the capability, everyone in this room has the capability to learn whatever it is you need to learn substantively to help solve these big problems. 
how can we use technology to achieve our vision? Why am I interested in this? Because community members have said, we think technology is part of the solution. OK, so let's go figure out technology together. Here are some estimates from a pilot study we did on the uh, south side using urban health initiative um, resources initially with some additional support from other small foundations. These give us estimates using um, probability sample of our population, um, digital communication technology use in the population. Jen Makalarski did all the data analysis and deserves a great deal of credit for this work. Um, it was just came out in the Journal of Urban Health, if you're interested in the paper. It's, on, it's online now. So these, these data speak for themselves. I think what's interesting, I, I've had a lot of interest in older adult health. Um, we have a natural tendency to look at things stratified by age. Um, we see um, relatively high overall digital communication technology use on the south side of Chicago, comparable to national estimates for the African American population, which actually says, I think, that given the degree of poverty on the south side of Chicago, um, that there's a real hunger for the technology. People are figuring out a way to get access and make use of technology even though they can't afford a lot of other stuff. Older adults are at an extreme disadvantage. Older adults living in, an ur in our urban area are really disconnected. And that's a problem because we know how important social connectedness is for healthy aging and wellness as people get older. And it's a place where we could really make an impact. You know, look, at, look at the proportions of older adults who are text messaging, um, using internet at home, have ever used the internet. A lot of older adults have cell phones, almost 70%. And Monica Peak made the point that there's a, real, a relatively easy way to make up this gap. Just show people how to use the, the text messaging feature on their phone, and people catch on pretty quickly. So we're working with several of the aging advocacy organizations on the south side and have a real interest in how technology can be used to decrease social isolation and increase, um, increase connection to the healthcare system. And I am wrapping up. I've been talking for a long time. I'm really thirsty. I was just telling Mark, I, I gave a talk yesterday for, for Mark to the medical students. And I wrote him an email after saying, I hate didactic talks. It does not suit me well. Um, so here I am talking nonstop for 45 minutes. But this is where we're hoping to go. This was one of the figures from the, um, the R01 proposal that we just submitted to NIH. And I want to acknowledge there are several people in this room who really helped make this proposal possible, including Eric Whitaker and Marshall Chin, all of the people <laughs> sitting back here who literally worked Christmas, New Year's uh, to get a January 6th deadline going, Dorian Miller, um, George Smith, uh, Leif helped us out. You know, raise your hand if you helped <laughs> and you, raise your hand if you were um, working for us on Christmas. <laughs> but really a tremendous collaborative effort. And many, many community organizations writing in support of this proposal. What we want to do now is leverage that, this amazing, unique asset data we have and, get in, and start a population health study in the communities we've mapped to understand whether, whether the assets in the community and which assets in the community relate to individual health. And how do those changes in time, does loss of five police stations in this region move with, the cha with health trajectories in the population, or does it not matter? Do we not need police stations for health? What we really need are fitness centers. So we're trying, I mean, it's extremely practical um, questions that we're trying to ask. So the communities um, that will be involved, that were proposed to be involved in this study are shaded here. These are the ones where we've done asset mapping and a few additional to give us a, a bigger contiguous area who agreed to work with us toward um, this proposal. Um, what's nice about this geographic region is that while we have many communities that are predominantly African American, we have three that have the, those three communities that have larger um, Hispanic populations, which just expands the relevance of our work for other communities. We have clinical sites that are using southsidehealth.org in their lobbies to help connect people to care. So it gives us something of uh, an opportunity to follow those people and the impact of those activities on health. And we have several communities that are considered Chicago smart communities, communities that have received funding from the federal government to promote community literacy for te around technology. So again, we're leveraging that opportunity to see whether those smart communities are healthier over time than the ones that don't get that intervention. So finally, how your work and skills can benefit and be stimulated by the local community. All right, so just make me feel good. How many of you sitting here have had some idea about how your work might relate to what we're doing, or feel somewhat inspired about how you know, your work might, be, um, might help advance the aims and vision of the Southside Health Vitality Studies. Anyone? 
Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so I told you the story about the Comer Food Pantry, which I just think, I hope you walk away with that, because that's the kind of thing, it's a simple but devastating problem with a simple and very feel-good solution. Here's another example of how the data, the, the data we've been collecting, the work we've been doing has benefited a community, clo our, our clo one of our closest neighbors, the Woodlawn community. <clears throat> As many of you may know, the Woodlawn community is interested in competing for or building something like the Harlem Children's Zone. They call it the Woodlawn Children's Promise Community. They've been working on this for a couple <laughs> of years. We went to the Health and Wellness Committee meeting. We were invited. We were part of their community engagement strategy. And in fact, it was so interesting to hear the community organization talk about how their challenges in engaging the community to help them with their work. In this case, we as university people were the community they were trying to engage. So here we went to the Community Health and Wellness Committee. We we're talking about um, kids and where do they get their health care. And we anticipated that might be of interest. So we went to our asset mapping data to query where are all the places for kids to get health care in the community of Woodlawn. Well, it turned out these were all the places that had anything to do with health, including curves of Woodlawn. Doesn't cater to kids. The only things we could find were La Rabita, which is for pretty sick kids, a tertiary care center for kids, and Dr. Chow Chen, whose phone never, you know, who does never answer his phone, at least all the times I've called. <laughs> I hope he's not in this room. If he is, I'd love to meet him. But if he's providing child care, it's very hard to get an appointment. Okay. So we said to them, look, we thought this might be of interest to you. These are the data we just collected with, with people from your community about Woodlawn. There's nowhere in Woodlawn for kids to get health care. So where are the kids getting their health care? So they said, let's go to the schools and see what they know. And they had health forms from the schools. One school worked with us, gave us 100 health forms that said the address of the doctor that the child had most recently seen. And we brought that back and asked Todd Schubel, who we have a little bit of money to pay in our social sciences division, to map those places out. So this is the whole, not just the city of Chicago, but goes down to Indiana and up to Wisconsin. And the big circles are where the most kids are getting care, and the little circles are only a few. Kids in Woodlawn are getting their care all over the city of Chicago, including Indiana and, and north of the city. So this was really interesting information for them. And as they think about building a health system for kids in Woodlawn, this is the community people they need to talk to, because these are the people who have been providing care for their kids. So it's just another example of how the infrastructure we're building can be used not only to advance the big aims, but to help quickly solve, answer um, smaller questions. So with that, I'd be happy to take some questions if there's time. Um, I want to encourage you, if I haven't already, to get involved. We all have our own individual fiefdoms of research, and that's good. That's how we survive in the academic setting. But for those of you who are looking for an outlet, to um, take your talent and skills and the things you're discovering and make them really salient and beneficial to the local community that sustains us, frankly, in our jobs, then please get involved with us. Our, all of our meetings are open. We won't kidnap you and make you come back forever. Just come to one and see how you like it or pop in whenever you can. Contact Natalie Watson. Nat, raise your hand. If you'd like to join one of our working groups, contact Lisa. Is she still here? Lisa? Oh, she's a lovely person. She's not here right now. But contact Lisa if you want to receive our monthly e-newsletter. Um, check us out on our website. Everybody welcome and needed. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening to me talk for so long. <clears throat> yes, I'm happy to take a couple questions. Stacey, how, how far are you uh, planning to take some of the... Um uh, outcomes measures that you're looking at. You mentioned at the very beginning uh, to, you know, getting a few drops of blood and perhaps you know, checking what the hemoglobin A1C is for people. Do, are you, do you have a vision of having a map in which you can tell what the mean hemoglobin A1C is in a neighborhood and can tell whether um, uh, somebody's intervention for increasing exercise or you know, decreasing you know, sh sugar, uh, high sugar content drinks in a community would um, change the average mean hemoglobin A1C in a community? Because if that's true, I mean, that sounds really wonderful. I don't think there's anything like that anywhere on the planet. I mean, our idea, thank you for asking that question. I don't know if the people in the back could hear, but it was really, what's the scope of ambition around the kinds of population health data we would collect. Um, the scope of ambition is um, <laughs> limitless, <laughs> high on ambition, it, and we'll have to get there in incrementally according to funding. So we have to be strategic. Community has told us that there are some high priority areas. Diabetes, obesity, um, fitness um, are, is really important. Safe um, outdoor space, really important to communities. Um, 
cardiovascular disease kind of fits in with that. Community members use the phrase metabolic syndrome and say, what are you doing about it? I mean, there's a lot of concern there. Um, there's concern about cancer and cancer risk. Um, there's concern about things like teen pregnancy and wellness and aging. So part of what we have to do is align um, community disease priorities with our best areas of expertise to start. Because those are the places where we have the most credibility for a funder where, who we'd have to ask for several million dollars really to get this thing off. And once we get started, then um, I really believe just based on the response to the asset data, the um, data will be so compelling that we will um, find a way to grow and be sustainable. Yes, the ambition is 34 community areas, a, a probabilistic sample so that we can make community by community comparisons. Um, the data collection would be a home-based survey unless somebody didn't want to be interviewed at home, face-to-face, self-report, biological measures, environmental like data. Like NHANES, but... Yeah. Like NHANES, but NHANES is a serial cross-section. And I think at this point, in an ideal world, we would have both serial cross-section and a longitudinal cohort for different reasons. I think we're going to start trying to build a longitudinal cohort. So the conversation around um, obtaining blood for any purpose for many people evokes um, feelings of mistrust you know, rooted in Tuskegee and other um, unethical um, ways in which we've conducted research in the past. And I say we uh, being part of the research community. Um, it's interesting how the dialogue has shifted. We've held some training sessions where community members could come and see how this methodology works for con um, obtaining blood. We had a major, we have a regular conversation about what's on the table, what's not. At the retreat, we had a couple breakout sessions simply around the collection of biological measures. And for the most part, people said is, we understand why you want to collect these data. My organization could use these kinds of data to advance its mission. It's not whether to do it, it's how you do it. It's got to be done right. And there is no room for error in terms of protection of confidentiality, um, respect for individual integrity, and making the data, um, getting the data back to people in a way that they can use it to improve their health. And so it, I think the conversation has largely shifted from why or why not to how are you going to do it. Stacy, it's remarkable work. Um, it's dizzying how many components you have to it. I, I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts at uh, two or three years in about um, the role that you think the University of Chicago is probably the biggest built asset, the biggest, um, and the richest institution on the south side. Uh, would have ideally you know, as this thing goes forward and I, I'm would it be do you think these are the right instruments the the uh, urban health initiative SS S8, you know that thing <laughs> um, and so on or do you is there are there other ideas that have come up about how the University of Chicago could serve the community better while continuing to serve its its uh, um, its goals of being a world-class research institution yeah, thank you I mean, I think there are a couple ways to answer that question. In my ideal um, world, I would lead this thing for only a few more years and then would hand it off to a strong community um, lead organization that would, be, that would take this, this project over a generation of time and we would be the technical partners. We would be the ones with the technical skills to execute the data collection, help ensure the validity and reliability of the findings, um, but that it would be a community-led endeavor. That would be my ideal. Maybe somewhere between you know, where I stand now and that moment, there's a junior faculty member, maybe an African-American MD, PhD, top of his or her game who we can recruit to the University of Chicago with this incredible opportunity and let them grow their career one stage. There's a real need to develop people, um, minority people in, in academic medicine as leaders, and then had, <laughs> hand it off to the community. So and th that's my honest feeling about it. With respect to my feeling about the Urban Health Initiative, I will say that you know, you know, in 11 years of working here, there was no opportunity like this until the Urban Health Initiative came with Eric and his leadership. And I, frankly, I, I, the way I see the history, it was um, a big part Michelle Obama and her vision, and Jim Madera and his vision. And you know, there are parts of the vision that were very business driven. And um, I really believe bigger parts of the vision that were about, it's just not right what's going on here, and we can do a lot better. I really do believe that. And whether it was or wasn't that, that's what it is now. 
Um, the University of Chicago is, has a very core focus on its, its um, product, its business product, which is world-class scholarship. And so what we're doing here has to be done as world-class scholarship or it will not be sustainable within the institution. It's part of my challenge has been, and, and it has been to sell this, what we're doing, to the Board of Trustees, to the Dean, to the Provost, to the President, um, as a tremendous research and development opportunity, the 21st century research and development opportunity for the University of Chicago. And the, at the same time, bringing it to the community as a tremendous research and development opportunity for each one of those important organizations that help sustain the region. It's tricky, it's challenging, it's an incredible, incredible career opportunity to be able to figure, help figure these challenges out with the other incredible people working on it. Um, but I, I, you know, the University of Chicago has a tremendous responsibility and I think it, uh, it's tricky to, to fulfill its social mission at the same time as it fills its um, business mission. Let me just take one more question. Uh, <clears throat> and that's all going to be on tape on the website? <laughs> Can we edit that part out? <laughs> you have to talk to Mark. <laughs> it's all true. Oh, my God. I can just see it now. Is there one more pressing final question for Dr. Lindau? If not, if not why don't you all? Um... I, maybe he was going to compliment me. Thank you. <clears throat>